know, we'll, we'll see if the microphone is turned on. It is, isn't it? Yeah, good. Thank you, Morag. <laughs> She's prejudiced. Um, and thank you uh, all for, for being here today and, and for inviting me um, to speak. Uh, this lecture allows me to make amends for a, a feeling of regret that, that I've carried through the past decade, uh, which involves coincidentally the woman to whom this lecture is dedicated. <clears throat> Uh, I met Philippa Pierce in 2005, and I'd recently published How I Live Now. Somebody from Penguin introduced us at the Unicorn Theatre in London, where Tom's Midnight Garden was being restaged. And she seemed a bit fragile. She, she was 85 at the time and sitting down. And we spoke for a few minutes about books, obviously, and, and writing. Um, she uh, seemed quite an old lady to me now, although 85 is looking younger and younger. Um, <clears throat> and I was uh, just recovering from uh, the cancer that had killed my sister, finishing treatment, not necessarily recovering. So we spoke for a few minutes um, after an acquaintance of a, about three or four minutes, we spoke about death um, in the most matter-of-fact manner. And I remember her saying to me, with a kind of rueful smile, that life is short, but it often feels interminable when you're trying to write a book. <laughs> At the time, I'd only published one novel and was struggling with the second, and I appreciate her words much more now, as I wallow in that awful period between books where the existence of the next is entirely in doubt. Um, now, having won the Guardian Fiction Prize, the Children's Fiction Prize, the previous year, I was judging the current year's submissions. It was about 100 children's books I had to read, including The Little Gentleman, which was the last full-length novel, as it turned out, to be published in Philippa's lifetime, and her first for 20 years. I told her at some embarrassing length how much I loved the book, it is possible that I badgered her a teensy bit with my enthusiasm. What I didn't tell her was that I knew very little about her. Of course, I grew up in America, where she was much we less well known. And by the time I moved to London and started writing for teenagers, I was 46 and had barely read any children's books for 30 years. I didn't even read Tom's Midnight Garden until I, after I saw the play. Probably desperate to escape this fawning middle-aged fan, the elderly Ms. Pierce scribbled down her address for me and invited me to continue our conversation if you are ever in the vicinity of Great Shelford. At the judging of the Guardian Fiction, Children, Children's Fiction Prize a few months later, I walked in carrying a single book. There was so little doubt in my mind that the little gentleman was the only possible winner that I didn't bother to bring any of the others along for discussion. Has anyone here ever judged a book prize? If you have, you will know why this is so wrong. It turns out that easy unanimity is not a phrase generally associated with book prizes. And on that day, it turned out that not all judges love and admire children's books about death to the same extent that I do. I was outvoted. The little gentleman didn't even make the short list, which outraged me. Of course, I won't reveal the names of those other misguided judges, but let's just say that there is some justice that I am standing here today, <laughs> rather than the current children's laureate. <clears throat> if you haven't read The Little Gentleman, by the way, I urgently recommend it. It's mainly a book about mortality, about death particularly, and it's written with such a light touch, such seriousness, such humor, and such a gimlet eye that I fell in love with it and its author instantly. Over the next 18 months, I did not happen to be passing Great Shelford, though I often thought about making a detour. Philippa Pierce died in late 2006, and to my lasting regret, we never met again. I have thought of her frequently over the intervening decade as I write about life and death and the vagaries of time and where, whether living forever is a good thing after all, because those are the subjects I'm interested in 
and I know for certain now that they are also the subjects Philippa was, was interested in. So it's in honor of her ghost and her humor and her wonderful twisty mind, but most of all in honor of her fearlessness at tackling big subjects that I thought I would tackle some of the thinking on the correct ways to write for children. And I will begin by telling you a fairy tale. You may have heard of it. It's called Goldilocks and the Three Bears. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Goldilocks. One fine day, she went for a walk in the forest and soon came to a pretty little woodland house. Well, it was not a pretty little woodland house, exactly. It was more of a cave. Well, no, it wasn't exactly a cave. It was more of a tunnel dug in the ground leading to a cramped underground den. Goldilocks knocked at the mouth of the tunnel and when no one answered, she crawled right in. At the table in the den, she found three bowls of porridge. Let's be accurate. There was no table. There was no kitchen. There was just a hole in the ground because bears lived here and bears do not have the fine motor skills to build kitchens. As for bowls of porridge, that would be untrue. In fact, what Goldilocks found were the rotting remains of three dead rabbits and a plentiful supply of ant pupae, which is a food high in fat that bears love very much. Goldilocks was very hungry, but not that hungry. Eventually, however, she gave in and tasted a bit of the first rotten rabbit. This is disgusting, she said. She tasted the second rabbit. This is even more disgusting, she said. She tasted the third rabbit. This is the most disgusting of all, she exclaimed, and decided to eat the peanut butter and salami sandwich her mother had packed for her that morning in her rucksack. After eating her sandwich, she felt a little sleepy, so she lay down in the first bed. Well, it wasn't really a bed. It was a kind of pile of leaves mixed with mud and bear excrement. That wasn't so nice, so she lay in the second bed, which was pretty much the same. Then she lay down in the third pile of leaves mixed with mud and bear excrement, and she fell fast asleep. As she was sleeping, the three bears came home, crawling down the tunnel and into the cramped den. Growl, growled the papa bear who weighed approximately 450 pounds and had four-inch, razor-sharp, non-retractable claws. Please note that he did not say someone's been eating my porridge because, of course, bears cannot speak human languages. And if they could speak any language at all, it would probably be French-Canadian. <laughs> Growl, growled the mama bear, who weighed approximately 300 pounds and had canines capable of ripping human flesh to shreds. Growl, growled the baby bear, who was somewhat less dangerous in himself, but whom both parents would defend to the death. Just then, Goldilocks woke up and saw the three bears. Oh, my heavens, she screamed. Help, help, help. But it was too late. They disemboweled and ate her. <laughs> the end. <laughs> now. According to a study out of Toronto University in Canada, this is the proper way to tell a story to children. Because the study claims traditional fairy tales may hinder children's learning by making them think that animals wear clothing and interact like people, which would be a lie, and it is obviously wrong to lie to children. By this logic, Peter Rabbit or Winnie the Pooh might mislead children into thinking that rabbits have names and wear little suits of clothing, that bears like to sing tumty dum tum, donkeys are depressed, baby can kangaroos have ADHD, and other terrible crimes against rationality. In other words, children's imaginations are dangerous, and it is the responsibility of responsible adults to stick to the facts. The author of this study warns parents and children that allowing children to think that bears are friendly creatures who live in rustic huts and eat porridge for breakfast might encourage a small child to develop an unhealthy relationship with a bear <laughs> that, at best, could never be reciprocated. At worst, well, 
The last thing we want is an epidemic of children sitting down to breakfast with bears. In this day and age, who knows what an innocent child and a fully grown bear might get up to. I read about this study in the Times last year and I figured it was a one-off, but no. A few weeks later, Richard Dawkins made a speech at the Cheltenham Literary Festival that was also reported in the papers. Most fairy tales do not stand up to scientific scrutiny, he announced. <laughs> a statement that, puzzlingly, made national news. Now, Richard Dawkins is a man of international renown in the field of atheism studies, and I suppose he's, he was referring to the fact that it is scientifically impossible, or at least it is a hypothesis with a low probability of corroboration that any person could spin straw into gold. According to evidence cited by Mr. Dawkins, geese do not lay golden eggs, frogs do not turn into princes, and in repeated clinical trials, no scientist has ever managed to change a pumpkin into a golden carriage. And four white mice will never be four white horses, as the song goes. I am sure you are as distressed by this news as I am. According to Dawkins, fairy tales may be dangerous. Parents, he said, should be fostering in children a spirit of skepticism instead of filling their heads with fantasy. It is pernicious, he continued, to encourage a view of the world which supports supernaturalism. In my 12 years membership in the children's book world, I have learned that there are many such alarmists out there. Harry Potter and The Hobbit, two of the five best-selling books of all time, have been criticized by a succession of religious authorities, mainly in America, my home country, for encouraging a belief in witches, hobbits, goblins, and all around supernaturalism. The theory being that even if J.R.R. Tolkien and J.K. Rowling didn't set out deliberately to promote witchcraft, they certainly nurtured dangerous sympathies, and those sympathies could well imperil the youth of today, threatening to lead them into evil satanic practices, or at the very least, a state of, and here I quote, moral ambiguity. Lord knows we don't want moral ambiguity on our consciences. Children's books are constantly under fire from one quarter or another. One moment they're too sophisticated, the next not sophisticated enough. We're told they must teach children good values, but they mustn't preach. They must foster diversity, but don't try writing as a Native American if you're not actually a Native American. They are nearly always too full of sex often the wrong sort of sex. And children, we're told, should be required to read excellent classical literature along the lines of Huckleberry Finn and Treasure Island, not all this gangsta granny and diary of a Minecraft zombie stuff. Does anyone remember Michael Gove? For me, the most dreaded words in relation to children's books always come from parents. I'll just read your novel first to see if it's appropriate for little Sarah or James or India. And I will always answer, let Sarah, James, and India make their own decisions about what to read. They might sneak off with your copy of Fifty Shades of Grey and discover how boring really badly written books are. <laughs> or they might read a hundred near identical pony books and then move on to Flashman, and then Catch-22, and then The World According to Garp, and eventually they might fall in love with Pride and Prejudice, and then even Shakespeare. I say that because it's what I did as a teenager, and every one of those books influenced the writer I became, particularly the pony books. All in all, I'm pretty convinced that if you, the parent, start by choosing books that are appropriate for your child to read, you will almost inevitably end up choosing who's appropriate for them to marry. There is probably a study proving it. <laughs> of course, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Twilight, and many of my favorite authors, such as David Amund, Philip Pullman, Margot Lanigan, Mal Pete, and Sally Gardner, offer examples of the serious dangers you might encounter when encouraging the imaginations of children. 
Not only do they occasionally foster belief in witches and the supernatural, but also anti-Christian and morally, morally compromising messages such as life can be complicated, people frequently do bad things, even good people occasionally do bad things, not everyone is happy all the time, and other terrible heresy that you wouldn't dream of wanting your child to discover. However, even if Richard Dawkins hadn't told us, we all know that lying to children, i.e. telling them stories that are not strictly true, can be very dangerous. And I have personal experience with this phenomenon. When my child was very young, my husband got somewhat carried away with Christmas. He's an artist, so on Christmas Eve, he decorated the entire living room with reindeer footprints. Every year, he drew a different card featuring a group self-portrait of all the reindeer with Santa, which they then all signed, Santa and the reindeer. It drove me insane. For one thing, I'm Jewish. For another, we'd been having the following conversation with my daughter pretty much from the moment she was born. She'd ask if there was any such thing as God, and we'd say, well, darling, lots of people disagree about whether there is a God or not, and Dad and I don't believe that there's any kind of big guy sitting up there in heaven with a beard or anything, but ultimately, you need to make up your own mind about faith and belief. But by the way, there is a guy in a red suit <laughs> with black shiny boots and a long white beard who flies through the air with a bunch of reindeer shoving presents down the chimneys of every house in the world on Christmas Eve. That's right, every house in the world on one single night. And if you don't have a chimney, he comes in a window. Really, she said, <laughs> looking scared. Yep, said my husband. I used to drag him out of the room and hiss that he was digging a great big hole for us and we were gonna be in huge trouble when she found out the truth, but he couldn't stop himself. He loved the story too much. Then she lost her first tooth. And being a well-brought-up child, she insisted on writing a thank-you note to the Tooth Fairy for leaving money under her pillow. Don't do it, I begged my husband. <laughs> but it was too late. He'd already started answering her with letters written in incy-teensy handwriting and signing them from Dilly the Tooth Fairy. Then one day, when my daughter was six, we were sitting in an Indian restaurant near our house in North London, and my daughter turned to my husband, all sweet, childish innocence, and she said, Daddy, is there really such a thing as Santa Claus? My husband helped himself to another spoonful of chicken tikka masala. Nope, he said. Her face crumpled in horror. No? Nope, he repeated. But what about the tooth fairy? Nope, no tooth fairy. A few years of psychotherapy and she was almost good as new. But as she frequently reminds her father with a mournful sigh, you destroyed my childhood. <laughs> When my daughter was little, we read all sorts of dirty, lying, politically incorrect books filled with dangerous, subversive characters like The Wild Things and Sam I Am. We read her everything by Dr. Seuss and Roald Dahl just to make sure she'd grow up with a sense of humor. And it worked. Like millions of other kids, she then went on to read Harry Potter over and over and over as soon as she was old enough until she knew it pretty much by heart. Then came Twilight and Hunger Games and as she got older, she began to connect with more difficult books. Most people have a book somewhere in their past that unlocked their brains and made them realize the possibilities of literature. For my daughter, it was Tom Stoppard's play, Arcadia. She was 16 years old, and it changed her life completely, connecting literature and her true love, mathematics, in a way that made her understand that the two are not opposites, 
but complementary. One enhances the other. The day after tomorrow, she's off to Edinburgh University to study physics, a subject she loves. And she'll be learning alongside people from all over the country who, she says with resignation, are mostly geniuses. You know the type. They lurk on street corners all around Cambridge, scribble, scribbling formulas into grubby notebooks and muttering weirdly at passers-by. That's how you know they're geniuses. I will never be as smart as they are, my daughter wails. Probably not, I say, thinking, phew. <laughs> but you have an advantage, I tell her. You read books, you make connections, you think about character and structure and stories and narrative arc. You like poetry, which means using language in a condensed, symbolic way. You look for twists in plot. You know all about fiction, which involves thinking unthinkable thoughts. Lies, some people call them. Invention, creativity, exaggeration. Thinking the unthinkable. <clears throat> you know about lateral thinking unexpected jinx in a narrative. This, I tell her, will make you a better scientist. It might someday even make you a great one because you need imagination to be a great scientist, just as you need imagination to be a great writer. People forget this. They think creativity belongs to artists, but imagination and the ability to tell a story makes you better at everything with the possible exception of accountancy, where creativity frequently lands you in jail. <laughs> with a great imagination, with creativity, and a, crea and a connection to the big subjects in life, you will be a better parent, a better lawyer, a better scientist, a better teacher, a better friend, a better person. As Albert Einstein said, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. I have thought for a long time what he meant by that. Here's what I think he meant. I think he meant that even if you're trying to figure out the origins of the universe, even with the most complex and difficult problems in the scientific world, what you're basically doing is telling a story. Sometimes it's a terrifying story. Often, it's a completely unlikely story. More often than not, if you tell a really original story, people will laugh at you. They'll tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done that way, no one's ever told that story that way before. Ask Peter Higgs about unlikely stories. He's the physicist who, back in the early 1970s, solved a great long-standing problem in particle physics with the hypothesis of what we now call the Higgs boson particle. No one wanted to work with me, he said in an interview last year. Nobody took what I was doing seriously. For nearly 50 years, no one would work with Peter Higgs because his fiction was too weird. His story seemed absurd, completely unlikely. So much so that seven billion improbably designed creatures living on a ball made of iron, rocks, and silicate floating in the middle of an unimaginable nothingness, deemed it too far-fetched. Of course, I would easily explain to you how amazing his hypothesis is and why it took nearly half a century to prove, but you probably don't understand physics as well as I do. So I will move along. Yuval Noah Harari, in his wonderful book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, tells us that the key quality, the one key quality that has allowed our species to survive and thrive century after century is the ability to create and believe fiction. While most animals use their communication skills for nothing more elaborate than descriptions of reality, Early Homo sapiens began using fiction to create new realities. For instance, to imagine the past or imagine the future, to agree upon a system of money or rules for marriage or war, to invent religion and God. For better or worse, Homo sapiens' ability to create fiction, to harness imagination, allowed us to wipe out a variety of other types of humans and put us in charge of life on Earth. 
at least until the mosquitoes take over. The stories of our origins traditionally have involved Adam and Eve and a snake in the garden of Eden, if you're Christian, which is a pretty unlikely story, or Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma, if you're Hindu, or a huge explosion out of nothingness, creating an infinite universe that expands and expands until one day it loses momentum and starts to collapse in on itself so that the entire mass of everything in existence eventually condenses to the size of a peanut. That's the story if you're a scientist. And we're supposed to worry about fairy tales? <laughs> Some of our best scientific theories involve a universe with many dimensions, not just the ones we can see or imagine, with wormholes connecting them like a game of chutes and ladders. Or what about the one about black holes giving birth to entire separate universes? I have begun to conclude that science produces far better fiction than religion. One of my favorite stories is about the Goldilocks planets. There may be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized pla Earth planets orbiting sun-like stars within our own Milky Way galaxy at a distance that makes them not too hot or not too cold. Goldilocks planets are theoretically able to support life, and that's just our galaxy. There are 500 billion galaxies in the universe. Don't ask me how they counted or who they are. But this means that there are 40 billion times 500 billion Goldilocks stars in the universe capable of supporting life as we know it. And then you think about Star Trek and the fact that all those foreign planets yielded people who look more or less like us, which I think is the most unlikely thing of all. The point is that bizarre fiction defines homo sapiens. And at the bottom of every amazing story, literary or scientific, is a person with the courage and the creativity to ask a good question. A physicist might ask, what makes all, up all that empty space in the universe? You and I might ask, does life completely different to ours even exist? Or we might ask, what do rabbits think about? Or if you're a writer, you'll probably be asking yourself over and over, is it too early to open a bottle of wine? <laughs> the job of each and every one of us is to try to understand the world, to make connections, to ask difficult questions, to break the rules, to imagine the universe, why we live and why we die, why we fall in love with one person and not another, why there's war, why some people are black and some white, why some people are rich, some poor, all the questions that, that humanity asks. Our destiny as homo sapiens with a gift of fiction is to imagine the future of the human race, to examine all the complicated, scary, or hopeful possibilities out there in space and in here in the space inside our heads. That's everyone's job, but writers don't have as much paperwork as everyone else, so we get to think about that stuff most of the time. Of course, stories can shape the world as well as reflect it. A 16-year-old girl stood up at an event I did a few months ago, and she said that she appreciated more than she could express how young adult novels were helping to change the way gender and sex were perceived in her school. This was something I hadn't really thought through. She said that the novels published for teenagers today are normalizing sex and gender choices that made people into freaks just a few years ago. Teenagers, of course, are still trying to figure out where they stand on sex and gender. There are kids who feel trapped in the wrong body, girls who don't feel like girls, boys who love other boys, boys who think rape is okay, girls who aren't sure how to say no, kids who've learned everything they know about sex from pornography. Or as my mother would say, in my day, we didn't have these problems. Everyone just got married. It didn't matter that they were gay. Who's that? Ah, how's this falling off? Okay. Hello. Let's do this. <clears throat> Look what happened to the way we view gender in just the past couple of years. 
Forget normalizing being gay. We've normalized being transgender almost overnight, enough so that when my daughter went to an 18th birthday party recently, it was, the best, it was her best friend from year five, then called Robert, now called Rachel. And I asked if any of the hundred or so teenagers at the party were giggly or snarky, and she looked at me appalled and said, why would they be? When you write for children and young people, you have the power to help someone else begin to write his or her life story, maybe even to change that story for the better. When I was 12, I read Madeline Langle's A, a Wrinkle in Time. There's a scene in it where Mrs. Watsit gives the heroine, who happens to be called Meg, a gift to help her defeat the dark forces. Meg, I give you your faults, Mrs. Watsit says. My faults, Meg cried. Your faults. But I'm always trying to get rid of my faults. Yes, Mrs. Watsit says. However, I think you'll find that they come in very handy in the future. When I read this passage, a small explosion went off in my head. It was the first time it had ever occurred to me that my faults might not just exist to make me feel bad about myself. They might be useful, even powerful. We are each told from babyhood to make the most of what we are, to concentrate on what we can do well, to accentuate the positive. The flaws embarrass us. We disguise them, hide them, condemn them to a realm of denial and self-improvement. Every day and every way, we are supposed to be getting better and better. But as well as being loyal, loving, and intelligent, the heroine of a wrinkle in time was impatient, angry, stubborn, unruly, disrespectful of her elders, passionate in the extreme. And these are the qualities, her so-called faults, that in the end save her. This literary moment has continued to resonate through my life. Some unformed instinct, and perhaps a deep sense of relief, caused me to fall in love with the power of flaws at the tender age of 12, and to remember it all my life, passing it down to my daughter and to the children I meet in my life as a writer. Treasure your faults, I tell them, just in case nobody else has. Enjoy your good qualities, show them off, use them to their best advantage, but when the going gets tough, fall back on the real stuff, the hardcore, the engine, the dangerous, turbocharged aspects of your personality, the rocket fuel of life, your faults. You wouldn't think this would be such a radical idea, but it has gained new resonance lately. In his 2014 book, Excellent Sheep, the Miseducation of the American Elite and the Way to a Meaningful Life, award-winning American essayist and educator William Duresevich wrote what's going on at the top level of American education. He says, our system of elite education manufactures young people who are smart and talented and driven, yes, but also anxious, timid, and lost with little intellectual curiosity and a stunted sense of purpose great at what they're doing, but no idea why they're doing it. This was written about Harvard and Yale, but applies just as well to elite British universities and the children who attend them. Like the highest rated state primary and secondary schools, these institutions admit top performing, highly driven, self-critical teenagers who have never dared to fail. They have never, I might say, had the opportunity to fail. When nothing but A-stars will do, you work ridiculously hard, but you don't take risks. You don't question the status quo. You don't question the structure of school or even why you have to take exams in the first place. You don't question the emphasis that society puts on a certain kind of success. You don't question your superiority if you succeed or your inferiority if you fail. And what if you achieve the so-called dream? Then what? If you win a beauty contest, you do not dedicate your life to changing society's perception of beauty. William Duresevich continues, 
So extreme are the admission standards now that kids who manage to get into elite universities have, by definition, never experienced anything but success. The prospect of not being successful terrifies them, disorientates them. The cost of falling short, even temporarily, becomes not merely practical, but existential. The result is a violent aversion to risk. All of this is happening at exactly the moment when we most need risk takers. People willing to take risks towards the, the achievement of meaningful social and political change. Individuals willing and able to retell the story of society in a more positive way. Hardly anyone would disagree that our political system needs changing. Free market capitalism has led to a terrifying extreme of wealth and poverty. Climate change, war, fragmented societies have led to a terrible, heartbreaking refugee crisis. The legal system favors those with money, as does education and housing. In the meantime, there is little financial motive to stem or even to acknowledge the devastating effects of global warming and social separation. It is difficult to think of a single aspect of life on Earth today that could not do with some rigorous deconstruction and rethinking. If society is interested in a better class of political leaders, entrepreneurs, scientists, parents, and social policy makers, we're going to have to ask ourselves which qualities to promote. Do we want our children to be more compassionate, more radical, less class-riven and self-centered, more concerned about the future of the planet? Do we want them to question authority? Or do we want them to be good, to follow the rules, accept someone else's truths, make as much money as possible, consolidate their own resources? Does anyone actually want a headstone with 13 A stars written on it? Each of us has the responsibility to write a compelling story of our own life, to decide what will be written on our own headstone. And if the idea of writing your own epitaph makes you feel a little bit afraid, well, that's a good sign. Because without fear, there is very little motivation for change. All of this will only happen when we rebel against the fiction that has been written for us, that more money makes us more happy, that school is the ultimate, ultimate arbiter of intelligence, and start writing a new fiction of the future. By asking the same basic question that writers ask every day, we stare at the terrible blank page. What if? What if is the writer's question. It is a wonderful, open, exciting question, but it's also a terrifying question because there are an infinity of answers, most of them dystopian if we judge by what's being written and published for young adults. Children's writers in particular have a myriad of what ifs to choose from. What if bears can talk? What if there is life on other planets? What if time isn't linear and gender isn't limited to male and female? What if we don't have to do what we're told? What if the whole education system is upside down and our so-called good qualities are less valuable to us than our faults? What if? what if? What if begins at the beginning of life? What if I cry? Will anyone answer? What if I smile? What if I pull myself upright? What if someone reads me a story? What if I remember it? What if it changes the way I grow up? I love the cat in the hat more and more as I get older, and sometimes think it is one of the very few masterpieces of modern literature. It reads like a postmodern anarchist's handbook. The Cat in the Hat was published in 1957, so it is possible I first heard it read to my older sister when I was one year old. This explains a lot. I stand before you, age 58, as the character who sneaks into children's homes when their mother has left them on their own, and it's raining, and the internet hasn't been invented yet. I am the character who suggests that they do the wrong thing. I have become my hero, much to my joy and pride. I am the cat in the hat. <laughs> the thing about books from the early part of your life that makes them much more important and more memorable than anything you're likely to read in your book group is that they're life-changing. 
They, are, they literally change your life. They don't just offer a bit of quiet insight about how the mortgage isn't as important as true love. They blow the world to smithereens. They teach about the forces of darkness and goodness and about what love might someday feel like, maybe will feel like for them, and how important it is to be an anarchist and think bad, uneasy, difficult thoughts and to change the world. But it gets better. Because when kids love a book, they'll read it 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. Can you imagine telling your friends that you've read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo 100 times and know every chapter by heart? But do you remember when you first read The Secret Garden or The Hobbit or Tom's Midnight Garden? I often think about how recently it was, historically, that little girls were shooed away from books and told to run around outdoors, forbidden to sit indoors all day, reading, in case it encouraged morbid fantasies. Books, after all, stimulate the pleasure centers of the brain and prevent engagement with real life. Engagement with real life is great and important and also unavoidable, as anyone with a job or a partner or a tax bill will know. But engagement with the inside of your head is dangerous and subversive and can change the world. Do not be afraid to be afraid, is what the heroine's father tells her in A Wrinkle in Time as she goes off on the most frightening journey of her life. In other words, do not be afraid to take risks. For writers, this means write a book that's too odd, too unruly, too difficult to pigeonhole, too full of ideas, too scratchy, too ahead of its time, too difficult. For everyone, it means think a thought that everyone says is wrong. Burn the rules. If you're Philippa Pierce, you might write a book about a 300-year-old mole who talks to a little girl about death. Or a boy who goes down to the garden when the clock strikes 13 and discovers that the past actually exists in parallel to the present. Sometimes I hate being a writer. Sometimes it's frightening and lonely, and most of the writers I know suffer from bouts of depression and self-doubt. I am between books at the moment, and I woke up, wake up every morning wondering if I will ever write another one. What if, I ask myself, what if I'm no good? What if I never, never have another idea? What if that last book I wrote was the last one I ever will write? What if no one likes the new one? What if every word is a, a, a terrible cliche? What if my family starves to death? Despite 15 hideous years in advertising, I occasionally wonder if it might not be easier to get a proper job than to live with this level of uncertainty. And then I remember that I'm not getting up every morning to write lies about soap powder or dog food, that my fiction doesn't involve narrowing anyone's prospects for the future, that I'm not lying to children about the importance of studying hard or making a lot of money or marrying someone appropriate, that I can write crazy fairy tales if I want to, that nobody can stop me from writing the future. And then I take a deep breath. Think big thoughts, I tell myself. Do not be afraid to be afraid. Thank you. Thank you, that was a wonderful lecture. Um, touching on something that you were talking about, Meg, um, it feels like to write for children, especially if you want to be sort of radical, is something that could make you quite afraid. 
do you feel like you've ever sort of given in to fear and maybe your work has suffered? You don't seem like the sort of person who would do that, but are there any examples where that's been the case, where you've let fear of maybe what other people think get the better of? That's a really, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'll tell you a, a slightly sideways story to answer that, which is that I took up horse riding uh, uh, after I hadn't done it for 35 years at the age of 50. Um, and I've just had to give it up because uh, I'd had something like eight concussions. And um, uh, I went to see a neurologist who said, before I gave up, who said, look, you've got to stop. You, you've got to stop this. Um, and um, I said, you mean I, I have to stop riding? And he says, well, at least you have to stop falling. <laughs> and and the, the problem was that I, by nature, I'm, I'm lacking the fear gene. And so uh, I would ride anything. And in the end, it got me into so much trouble that I've had to give up what I really love doing. Luckily, writing, uh, writing isn't quite so physically dangerous, as far as I know, unless you're Salman Rushdie. Um, uh, and so, and, and the other thing is, I've, of course, been very, very lucky, which is, you know, I started when I was 46. Uh, I hadn't written hundreds of novels before that. My first novel was a big success. And that gives you a lot of freedom because uh, publishers are hoping that you'll have another success so they don't bother you too much. Um, and so, luckily, I've been able to write pretty much whatever I want. Having said that, um, I would say that it, in lots of ways, I am exactly the right person to be writing for, for children and for teenagers because um, I, I wouldn't really want to write... I do write really challenging, difficult things, I think. Um, and, and I do, and I am obsessed with mortality, you know, and I'm obsessed with writing about death and reading about death and, you know, ver versions of that and coming of age and all that sort of stuff. But I, I wouldn't write a book, for instance, like The Bunker Diaries, um, you know, and, and I'm a great admirer of many of Kevin Brooks's books, but not that one. Um, so, you know, in, I haven't read, and, and I know he had terrible trouble with his publisher because it was my publisher back then, uh, over that book. And they felt it was deeply inappropriate. You know, who knows what's, what's deeply inappropriate? You know, kids seem to love that book. You know, and I think that there's a, I think kids have a greater capacity for darkness than adults really ever give them credit for. So, you know, the short answer is, not really. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and I think the wonderful thing about this kind of great so-called golden age of, of writing for children is that, you know, you'll almost always find someone to take a punt on it. This question down here. Could you, sh yeah. Shout and I'll repeat it. Um, so thinking about what you're reading as well as what you're writing. Thank you. Um, do you still read children's literature? Oh, that's an interesting question. I read less and less um, contemporary fiction, which is a terrible thing to admit. And I used to be utterly furious with people when they said that. Um, but I do find I'm going back more and more to stuff that has survived. Uh, even if it's only survived 20 years. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, at the moment, um, I'm reading Catch-22 again because I haven't read it since I was 15 and, and I was really interested. You know, there are writers now. I mean, I was talking to a very good writer friend of mine, a guy called Andy Stanton, who is, you know, talk about anarchist um, children's writers. I mean, he's a complete weirdo. Um, <laughs> And he was telling me, I told him that I was off to do this Philippa Pierce lecture, and he said, oh my God, Philippa Pierce, I've just read everything she's ever written because it's all still in print, or most of it's still in print, and it's so utterly brilliant. And I do have trouble with a lot of what's being written now because a lot of stuff that you know gets a wonderful review and I sit down to read it with great excitement, um, I think, I just don't like it very much. 
And it's the same as absolutely true of adult literature as it is of children's literature. I had to read the new Jonathan Franzen book for Saturday Review on the BBC last week. And, um, I, you know, I had to admit, I just couldn't get through it. I just can't stand Jonathan Franzen, <laughs> you know. I know tons of people think he's a genius, but, uh, you know, I just don't. Um, so I mean, it's not to say that there aren't wonderful, wonderful writers writing now. There are. You know, I'll read, uh, I'll read Marilyn Robinson or, or anything um, Hilary Mantel wants to write. Strangely, whenever I start making these lists, it's almost always female writers, but, you know, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult, I think. You know, th there's an industry to keep going. And so people will say this is the finest, you know, five stars is the finest book written since the last finest book written. Um, but, you know, if a book has been around for 20 years and people are still reading it and it's still in print, you can pretty much feel secure that it's got something going for it. Yeah, well, then that's a really interesting question, too. Um, I had written, there's a very long story that goes with this, but I had written, my first novel was a pony book um, that I submitted to um, uh, an agent who happened to be a friend of a friend of a friend, and she finally got, she turned me down, and then someone else turned me down, and then she called me back and said, okay, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll try again, but uh, I want you to write another book. Um, the, the problem, if anybody's ever heard me speak about it, is that the pony book had much too much sex in it. And she said, maybe you might try writing for a little bit um, older. So I always think it was kind of a coincidence, in a way, that I was writing for teenagers, because I tried to write a pony book, because I was pretty much convinced I couldn't write a proper book. But I could write a pony book, because I'd read every pony book. Um, and uh, so... Um, I was really only thinking of one person when I wrote How I Live Now, and that was the agent, because I was in a job <laughs> that I hated, and I thought, you know, here I am, 46 years old, riven with self-loathing. If I can't write a book that she loves, I will work in advertising until the day I die, which will be very soon. Um, and so really, I, I wrote that book for her. Um, and. You know, then once you have a bit of success, then you do have that, as I said, you have a, a bit more freedom. And so it's never really occurred to me to write for an audience. I've written about adolescence because adolescence, um, you know, somebody told me a theory that writers often write about the place in life they got stuck. And I was stuck in adolescence for, for years. I mean, you know, until I was well into my 40s. I mean, I only found out, you know, I had a door, I had a, my only child when I was 40. I got married after my parents were convinced I was a lesbian. Um, and I only um, wrote my first novel, you know, when I was 46. So I'm a, talk about a late bloomer. You know, I was stuck in adolescence for decades. And so I write about coming of age because that's what I'm interested in. That's what I talked about in therapy. That's what I had to think about. You know, why does everyone see the world clearly and I can't? You know, and, and you know, that's the subject uh, of my books. And my new book, the book that's coming out next, is actually an adult book. But the only thing that makes it, the only thing I believe that separates it from all the other books I've written is that the protagonist is not 16, 17, 18, 19, but in fact, explicitly 23, because he has a job. So, you know, marketing departments, you know, have a whole agenda. And I'm not really that, you know, I can't be interested in marketing departments because I have to write what I am interested in. Otherwise, the books wouldn't have any truth to them. They wouldn't have any resonance. And I think resonance is the most important thing a book can have. Um, you mentioned in your lecture how we could possibly be heading towards a world more accepting of gender and sexuality. Do you believe we might actually reach that one day? And uh, to help that, maybe should we start introducing kids to literature, famous literature, at an earlier age? Uh, did everybody hear that that question? Yeah. Uh, I have. To, 
I have so many feelings about that question. Um, uh, yes, I think we are accepting greater gender diversity. I mean, even the Supreme Court in the United States of Crazy America has accepted that gay marriage is the right thing, but you know that doesn't mean that Americans have accepted it. Um, I don't believe history is a, a remotely linear. I, I think the minute you you know decide what the next ten years is going to look like, you know you are in big trouble because it's a kind of hubris. You know, when the gods are all up there going, oh yeah, well, I'll show you. Um, so that's the answer to the first bit of the question. The answer to, sh you know, should we be writing books that introduce children to those concepts very early? I, it's sort of the same question of whether, you know, which is raging in, in YA literature now is, you know, we must write books with more diversity. Well, yeah, we probably should be doing that, but I'm not going to do that. You know, diversity isn't my subject. Um, I am very interested in gender, and I've written quite a lot about gender, um, because gender is my subject. You know, it's, it's, it has a huge resonance to me. Um, so I don't think you can set authors out with an agenda uh, to tackle certain subjects. Um, you know, I was talking about my daughter founded the femi um, FemSoc at her school, and she was saying in Scandinavia, they start talking to boys about not being rapists, you know, from the age of four. Um, and, you know, that is when those conversations should be happening. And those conversations about tolerance should be happening at that age. And conversations about money should be happening at that age. So yes, I mean, I, you know, as I said in my lecture, get kids when they're two. Start with, you know, cat in the hat, you know, and, and make them understand that it's important to do bad things when your mother is out. <laughs> um, but but, but not, not as an, not as a, uh, you know, as, as an agenda in schools. You know, my feeling is li li literature has to have its own agenda in order to be true.